It's my pleasure to welcome Ben Webster of Northeastern University who will speak to us today on representation theory of symplectic singularities. Ben. All right, well, thanks very much for the invitation. Chance to, you know, speak to the whole internet. I'm sure are all listening. All right, so those of you who actually read my abstract, um, it contains sort of some, some strange combination of ideas that I am sort of someone who comes out of representation theory, but a lot of what I do sort of involves stuff from algebraic and symplectic geometry. So sort of my, my big picture idea is to try to explain, well, how do those things match up? Why, why do I want to think about both of those things simultaneously? Um, and sort of the, the motivating example for me is that if you're interested in any non-commutative algebra in the world, if you, if you believe that non-commutative algebra is a good idea, then surely you believe that the universal enveloping algebra of a Lie algebra is an interesting non-commutative algebra. So sort of the, at least one of the first things I'm going to do is sort of how to see that in the context of symplectic geometry, symplectic singularities, deformation quantization, and then sort of try to put that in a more general context. So sort of one of the outputs are going to be other interesting non-commutative algebras that I can think of as uh, kind of brothers of universal enveloping algebras, that somehow they actually live in some in interesting bigger class of algebras that some of which people had found and some of which people hadn't noticed yet. All right. So this is my, I mean, I should warn at least a few people in this room. I mean, this is kind of supposed to be a colloquium talk. So it's, it's going to contain some basic stuff at the beginning, but I'm sure that's good for some people as well. So I use this word quantization. And quantization is one of these words that mathematicians have started to love to use, but it can mean all kinds of crazy different things. So for me, in this context, it means that you take something commutative and you make it non-commutative. So the kind of basic example I hope everyone could understand is when you go from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics. Okay, nobody actually understands quantum mechanics. But we know something happens like in classical mechanics, we had these observables, position and momentum, and now they become operators that don't commute anymore. Um, and they become x and, OK, I've left out some factors of i h bar, but whatever. Um, basically become x and d dx. And there's this basic relation between d dx and x, which is that their commutator is 1, right? This is no longer a commutative algebra. I'm thinking of the operation of multiply by x and the operation of differentiate. Um, and one of these sort of basic calculus calculations is the commutators of these operators is the identity operator. So when I look at this, I say, aha, x and ddx, well, they don't commute anymore. They commute modulo lower order terms. Now, if you were a physicist, you would say, oh, actually, there's some term of h bar you forgot there. So when I say lower order terms, I mean terms that go away. Sorry, I'm standing in the wrong place, I think. But hopefully that's all right. Um, terms that go away when h bar goes to 0. Now, for me, I sort of like to think of this more in this, this algebraist way, which is I say, OK, I'm just going to declare x and ddx to have degree 1. This is in a homogeneous relation, so I don't get a grading. I get a filtration instead. And if I take associated graded of that filtration, exactly what I get back to is commutative polynomials again. So physicists would say I'm setting h bar to 0. I kind of prefer to say I'm taking some non-commutative algebra and I'm taking the associated graded of some natural filtration. All right. Everybody with me? Any questions? So you might say, well, that's a cute observation. And I mean, of course, Right, somehow in, in quantum mechanics, you have experiments to tell you what the right way to take commutative things and make them non-commutative is. If you say, well, why was that right, the right thing to do? 
I would say, oh, well, there's this double split experiment, yada, yada, yada. Um, in mathematics, of course, we don't have experiments, right? We have to have some other rationale for deciding whether things are good. And, and one of the ways we decide that is sort of things that are somehow systematic, right? Uh, mathematicians don't like ad hoc examples. They like to sort of organize everything and, and sort of have some general principles that are working in the background. So, well, if you just say, I'm going to take non-commutative algebras whose associated graded or something nice, that's not something that's kind of very systematic. So you want to do something a little more precise. You want to take a commutative algebra with a little bit of the non-commutative structure remembered. So I am going to try to motivate this from physics, which is in physics, when you sort of relate equations in quantum mechanics and classical mechanics, commutator in quantum mechanics corresponds to this operation Poisson bracket in classical mechanics. So here I've written the sort of basic equations of motion uh, in quantum and classical mechanics in a form so that you can match them up. This isn't usually how people write Hamilton's equation. But this is the sort of general form of, of Hamilton's equation for how any observed quantity will change with respect to time. The, the quantum mechanical equivalent of that is how does an operator change with respect to time. All right. So somehow, this Poisson bracket, that's part of the structure of classical mechanics. It's sort of part of what's getting matched up with the non-commutative structure here. And whereas commutator is, is something intrinsic for multiplication of operators, Poisson bracket is not. Right? It's not something that's intrinsic to the polynomial ring. It's some extra piece of structure that, you know, okay, if you, if you talk to Hamilton, it's, it's telling you something extra about the universe, that there's a Poisson bracket. So in this kind of language of taking non-commutative algebras and passing to commutative ones, what this Poisson bracket is, is it's the sort of first order piece of commutator, right? Now, commutator becomes trivial in the new algebra, but I can kind of remember the next order piece of it, and that will give me my Poisson And you can prove that if you start not just with two variable polynomials as a graded algebra, but two variable polynomials as a graded algebra, and this particular Poisson bracket, I mean the one that comes from classical mechanics on a line, the only way to turn that into a non-commutative filtered algebra is to look at the algebra generated by x and dd. So that's something that's sort of nice and systematic. I didn't just notice that there's some non-commutative algebra that gives me the right thing when I take associated graded. I started with some sort of commutative object that's something out of algebraic geometry, and I turned it into a non-commutative object in a totally canonical way. There's sort of only one way to do it. So how do I want to generalize things? Right? This is supposed to be my like, most basic example that, that doesn't sort of hurt anyone's brain. Um, we'll, we'll get to those later. Um, so there's a notion of Poisson bracket on any commutative algebra. And it's an operation that behaves like Poisson bracket in classical mechanics. Um, now, differential geometers would say, oh, it's a bivector with such and such and such a property. I, I'm sort of trying to speak in algebraic geometry terms and algebra representation theory terms. So I'm going to sort of talk about functions instead of bivectors. And in that case, it's a bilinear map on functions, which is a Lie bracket. It's anti-symmetric and satisfies the Jacobi equation. And it satisfies the Leibniz rule with respect to commutative multiplication. Um, so if you're used to sort of switching back and forth between differentials and um, uh, 
yeah, the sort of directional derivatives in vector fields, this is sort of saying exactly that uh, the operation of take Poisson bracket with a fixed thing is the directional derivative for some vector field. That's how you switch between this picture and the picture using a bivector. So the point is, this is a structure you can put on a ring that makes it look like there's some non-commutative thing hiding in the background, where you got this one by taking associated grade. Right? If I start with two variable polynomials and that particular Poisson bracket, which is the same as the symplectic structure it gets from being T star of C, then actually that non-commutative algebra, usually called the vial algebra, is hiding in the background. And actually, I only need to tell you this kind of commutative algebraic geometry information, and the vial algebra will just pop out at you. You sort of, I mean, this is, this is a theorem, but it's an easy theorem. If, if you get lost in the rest of the talk, just try to prove this by hand. It's, it's pretty simple, actually. So are there other commutative algebras with this extra structure where non-commutative things will jump out at me? This is sort of the basic question I want to address in this talk. Um, and so what is the structure I should put on an algebra where I expect a non-commutative thing to be hiding in the background? Well, it should be graded. I expect it to be associated graded, so it had better be graded. And it should have a Poisson bracket that's homogeneous for this grading. Basically, when I take the, the Poisson bracket of two things, uh, you add the degrees and then subtract some number. So if you look at this formula, what is this going to do to the degrees of polynomials? I'm going to add them, and then I'm going to subtract two because I differentiated twice. Uh, all right. And if I find an algebra that has those structures, well, it might be the classical limit of some interesting non-commutative algebra. And for me, that sort of is going to be the sign of, ah, this is an algebra you should study. This is an interesting algebra, one that's worth worrying about, right? Um, there are a lot of non-commutative algebras in the world. You can't just run around randomly studying them willy-nilly. You have to have some ideas about which ones are important and which ones you can just ignore. All right, and so this is really what I mean by this word quantization. It means that I started with a affine variety or a ring that has these structures that make it look like it's an associated graded of something non-commutative. And I find that non-commutative thing. The non-commutative thing is the quantization. So this theorem I stated on the last slide, I could say this vial algebra is the unique quantization of two variable polynomials with this particular Poisson structure. So you might ask, well, what about other Poisson varieties? What, you know, sort of how systematically can I do this? Well, all right, for, for completely arbitrary, let's say, Poisson manifolds, this is very, very non-trivial. Um, so, Kansevich got a Fields Medal, really for, for fi figuring out sort of what quantizations of Rn with real Poisson structures look like. Um, and he sort of, I mean, it's a relatively abstract construction, but he gave a way of sort of taking any Poisson structure on Rn, finding a quantization of it, and kind of understanding what the space of them look like. But it's a complicated answer. It's hard, hard to really see what's going on, and people are still sort of trying to work that out. But I would say, well, maybe he wasn't trying to do too much, but I, I want to make my life easier. So I don't want to work in that kind of generality. I don't want to start with Rn and just write down a completely random Poisson structure on it. That's, that's way too hard. So I would much rather take something that's symplectic or somehow wants to be symplectic. This is, a, this is a, a point I'm going to do my darndest to gloss over in this talk, um, because really I'm going to be interested in things that are not quite symplectic, but do have some 
You know, they, in their heart, they know they're symplectic, even though they're obviously not. All right, so the sort of other really concrete example that I hope a lot of people know that I want to think about is what's called the kostent kirilov suryau bracket on, this is functions on the dual of a Lie algebra. So this is an algebra that many people would call sim of the Lie algebra, right? It's the same thing. Uh, so you, you may have heard this fact, or I, I actually think there are several people who are in my symplectic geometry class, and I know heard me say this fact, co-adjoint orbits of any Lie group have a symplectic structure. And where the symplectic structure comes from is actually a Poisson bracket on the manifold dual of the Lie algebra. And it's actually, it's a little hard to write this down without making it look totally tautological. But where it comes from is if I take elements of the Lie algebra, those are linear functions on G dual. So they should have some Poisson bracket. And the Poisson bracket of those two functions is the function associated to the Lie bracket of the elements. So the linear functions on G dual, which are of course isomorphic to G as a vector space, become the Lie algebra G in the obvious way. That's, that's what this is saying. And once you know that, well, you can use the Leibniz rule to define the bracket on any polynomial. Now this is reasonably famous, but the quantization I would say is actually considerably more famous. It's the universal enveloping algebra of G. Again, something that's a little hard to write down in a way that isn't tautological, right? This is the sort of universal associative algebra generated by symbols that are elements of the Lie algebra with the relation that if I take commutator in the associative algebra sense, that's the same as taking the Lie bracket. Um, so these are sort of, you should see that these are very similar. And if you sort of follow things through, exactly what the PBW theorem says is that U of G is a quantization of G star. So you're maybe familiar with the statement of the PBW theorem that says U of G, when I take its associated graded, is sim of the symmetric algebra on G. Well, that's the same as uh, functions on G dual, polynomial functions on G dual. Um, and if you follow through, well, what's the induced Poisson bracket? It's exactly this one. And much like this story with two variable polynomials, if, as long as your Lie algebra is semi-simple, then this is the unique way to quantize that Poisson manifold. I mean, in the sense that I wrote earlier. So just like with that nice symplectic thing, you get a unique quantization. So that went pretty well. And on the other hand, G star isn't symplectic. So this is kind of where this, this claim that some things that aren't symplectic feel symplectic. And G star is one of them. So the, the thing I want you to think about is what about the case when G is GLN? So N by N matrices with Lie bracket given by actual commutator of matrices. So this uh, you can identify with its dual. So when I wrote C of G dual before, I can, you can think of that as functions on matrices. And the co-adjoint orbits are exactly the matrices that are conjugate to each other. So in particular matrices that have the same eigenvalues that are diagonalizable. Of course, there's sort of a few complicated things about Jordan blocks. But you can take this guy and you can sort of cut it up into its pieces where you fix the eigenvalues. And these sort of behave, if they're smooth, they're actually symplectic. They always have a symplectic structure and they're smooth locus. And the thing that's secretly symplectic about G star is the way it's built out of these pieces. So again, I'm, I'm gonna gloss over this. We can talk about it afterwards. Um, but the important thing about G star is it's built out of symplectic pieces in a very special way and the very special way 
is that it's, it's a kind of universal family. If you take any of these symplectic guys and try to deform it in a way that keeps the symplectic structure, you'll actually get this family. Um, so the sort of most interesting piece is the nil cone. That's the nilpotent matrices. And actually all of G star is the universal way of deforming the nil cone that still has a Poisson structure. Um, somehow the, it makes me feel better if I call this a semi-classical deformation, right? So the nil cone, it's not just a manifold or it's not just a variety. It has, I mean, it's not a manifold at all. It's a singular algebraic variety, but it has this extra structure, this sort of semi-classical structure, a Poisson bracket. And I'm very interested in that structure. I want to keep it. And I want to sort of think of all the ways I can take this nil cone and sort of smooth things out or change the equations, but in such a way that I still keep that semi-classical structure. And the only way to do that is to change the eigenvalues. Um, so why did I do this? Well, this gets me back to sort of starting with something symplectic. So before I started with C2, that was already symplectic. Now I'm going to start with the nil cone. That's symplectic. I'm going to deform it in all the ways I can that'll stay Poisson. If I do this with C2, I just, I can't deform it in an interesting way. But with the nil cone, I can. And when I do that, I get G star. And then that thing has a unique quantization. So in this case, if I start with the nil cone, I'll get U of G. So, okay, there, there was a lot of stuff in there and I, I glossed over some things, but the important thing is I start with a purely algebraic geometric object. Uh, affine algebraic variety defined by some equations and a Poisson structure on its functions. So this is all sort of stuff in commutative algebraic geometry. And I do something canonical, which I didn't explain in all its details, but it is canonical. And bang, out pops the universal enveloping algebra. So whatever this construction is, what are the other things we can apply it to? Where else could this be useful, right? So when I said I wanted to put the universal enveloping algebra in some bigger context where we find that it has some interesting relatives, it's exactly in the context of, ah, we got this by starting with a nice variety with a certain kind of Poisson structure on it, doing a kind of completely canonical thing, and the universal enveloping algebra is the non-commutative algebra we get out at the end. All right, so the things we can put in this place are what I call conical symplectic varieties. So the important thing is it's a variety Conical means that its coordinate ring is graded, um, right? That means that you can embed it in affine space invariant under a C star action that sucks everything down to a point. Um, so it's a cone in the sense of algebraic geometry. Um, and it has a Poisson structure that on the smooth locus induces a symplectic structure. And there's also a few extra con technical conditions I'm sweeping under the rug. They, they aren't very important. Um, I mean, on some level, they're very important, but they're not very significant, is perhaps a better way to say it. So for example, if I take C2n with the usual symplectic structure and any finite group acting on that, preserving the symplectic structure, I can take this quotient. And these can be incredibly complicated spaces, right? There are algebraic geometers who spend their entire careers studying, take a vector space, mod out by a finite group. Um, so this is, this is one interesting example you should keep in mind. And some interesting things happen just based on this guy. Sorry, were you? Uh, well, to, you're not going to have much luck putting a symplectic structure on something that's odd dimensional. Oh, but I, I, algebraic. I mean, I... It, Every, everything here is holomorphic. So when I say symplectic variety, right, I, I have a Poisson bracket on holomorphic functions that preserves them being holomorphic. Right, right. So I'm, 
Right. If you're going to think in terms of real geometry, you should actually think that everything should be hyperkähler. That's the sort of real geometry condition that's, that's going to come in. So, for example, right, this guy is hyperkähler. There's a hyperkähler structure in C2n um, that's preserved by gamma. So the quotient is, is hyperkähler. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to stay in, in algebraic geometry. And I mean, this is something that I, I don't want to get too deep into. But the symplectic condi the condition of being sort of symplectic in the algebra geometric sense, that there's a complex holomorphic two form, which is non-degenerate in the usual sense, right? That's much harder than being symplectic in, in real geometry in the same way that being kalabi yao is a lot harder than being orientable. Um, so it's a much stronger condition, but it, that means that we get sort of nice stuff in algebraic geometry. Um, and one sort of interesting vein of algebraic geometry in recent years has been the study of symplectic things in, in the sort of complex sense. Um, and they're, they're sort of much nicer than usual singularities. We'll have one example of the sense in which that's true. Are there any other questions? All right. So, um, there are some other examples that come from Lie theory. So I know there are some people in this town who are very interested, for example, in Slotovy slices. Um, or, you know, other nilpotent orbits. So if I take, you know, the stuff with Jordan decomposition given by some random partition, that has a symplectic structure, and its closure is one of these conical symplectic varieties. Uh, there are examples that come out of toric geometry called hypertoric varieties, which have some interesting relations to the common torics of hyperplane arrangements. And there are examples that come from geometric representation theory. So some that come out of the affine Grossmannian and these things called Nakajima quiver varieties. Kind of both of these are some kind of geometric avatar of the representation theory of Lie algebras. Um, uh, those who are not experts on the topic might find it a little weird that I say, okay, I have things coming from Lie theory here, and coming from geometric representation theory here. But the Lie algebra is playing a very different role um, in these two pictures. I mean, in this, it will actually be something about the geometry of the Lie algebra and subvarieties inside it. And here, it will be something constructed out of the quiver, for example. Uh, you know, the Dinkin diagram. All right, so whenever I have one of these, it has a nice deformation that looks like G star. And in what sense does it look like G star? So this is the, the deformation that kind of deforms it in all ways possible while still keeping a symplectic structure on the smooth locus. Well, one kind of amazing fact is the base of this deformation is a vector space that's finite dimensional. Now, if you take a random algebraic variety and look at all the ways you can deform it, that's a very complicated problem. Uh, there's sort of very complicated obstruction theory. You can have an infinite dimensional space of parameters. None of that stuff can happen if you require that your deformation be symplectic. So somehow, you're, there are relatively few examples of these, but it excludes a lot of the horrible things that can happen in algebraic geometry. So just to give you kind of a, a flavor of these, so one nice example is if I take C2 and mod out by a, a cyclic group acting symplectically. So that means this has to be acting by multiplying by a root of unity in one coordinate and its inverse in the other. And if you think about what invariant polynomials for that look like, it will be the lth power of one coordinate, the lth power of the other coordinate, and the product of the two coordinates. And the relation between those will be xy equals c to the n. Um, so this universal deformation is exactly gotten by going to this equation and saying, well, okay, maybe I shouldn't require xy equals z to the L. Maybe it should just be xy has some polynomial relation in z of degree L. So these indeterminates in the equation become the coordinates of my deformation. So if I specialize those to numbers, I'm taking one of the other interesting fibers which will be much smoother. So this is something that's going to be smooth if all the roots of this polynomial are distinct.
and will be uh, uh, involve other singularities of this type for smaller cyclic groups if some of the roots coincide, but not all of them. Probably, yeah. That sounds about right. Um, yeah, that, that sounds pretty plausible. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't swear to it. Um, and in many other cases, this comes from, if you got your variety by some kind of symplectic reduction, this usually comes from varying the moment map. So that's the other sort of thing you might have in mind. And, well, why did I want this universal deformation? I mean, aside from it being kind of a cool piece of algebraic geometry that this thing exists, well, it turns out that this guy has a unique quantization. So if I start with one of these symplectic singularities, that's not going to be quantizable in a unique way. It's after I deform it that there's sort of only one thing I can do. Um, and I get a non-commutative algebra. Its center is a polynomial ring in my choices of deformations. So what used to be the parameter space downstairs for the commutative deformation functions on that are the center of this quantization and the different ways of quantizing my original cone are modding out by maximal ideals in that center. So for example, for the universal enveloping algebra, um, the cone I deform over is exactly sort of, uh, it's a similar sort of thing where I'm choosing coefficients of some polynomial. Um, and so I, this matches up with this sort of famous result uh, that the center of a universal enveloping algebra of a semi-simple Lie algebra is a polynomial ring um, of and exactly sort of polynomials that are invariant under the vowel group on the torus. Um, so out of this, exactly what, what we get is that if you start with one of these symplectic singularities, there's a canonical way of getting an interesting non-commutative algebra which generalizes the universal enveloping algebra as promised. So another sort of cool thing here is that this tells you what the sort of parameter space of different quantizations of this cone are. And they're the same as the parameter space of semi-classical deformations, deformations where I, I keep the symplectic structure. So for me, this is sort of a remarkable fact, but it's true. Oh, um, yeah, I, I would have to think about exactly what this says in this case, but I, I'm sure it's getting back some kind of classical result about, you know, th this is going to be something about deforming primitive ideals. Um, so, yeah, I mean, for example, for... Richardson orbits this is exactly you're sort of getting back the twisted D modules on T star G mod P. Um, so the, the, certainly f uh, somehow I, I understand Richardson orbits a bit better than the other ones because they have nice resolutions. So in that case it sort of matches up perfectly. I, I know. Um, anything else? Ah, well what you get for I think I was even going to say this on the next slide. Um, for CN mod gamma, what you get is a symplectic reflection algebra. Um, so when you mod out by a group, uh, a, a finite group acting symplectically, you sort of get ways of deforming the quotient out of s complex reflections. Uh, maybe they have to also be symplectic. So sort of things that look like T star applied to a complex reflection. Um, there's this notion of what a, what a symplectic reflection is. So this is something that was already known somehow. Um, I mean, you might think that the right thing to do in this case, right, is to replace C2N with differential operators on CN and take invariance of the group acting on those, um, which you can do but that's not universal. There's sort of some extra deformation parameters where you can change things more. Um, and that's exactly these symplectic reflection algebras. <laughs>
Um, I, I think that's addressing your question. OK. Good. All right. So like I said, um, from the nil cone, you get the universal enveloping algebra. From other examples in Lie theory, you can get things like symplectic reflection algebras. You can get these, uh, sorry, finite W algebras. You can get these symplectic reflection algebras. Excuse me. These examples from the affine Grassmannian seem to give you these guys uh, we call shifted Yangians. This is something I did relatively recently with uh, Joel Kamnitzer, Alex Weeks, and Oded Jacobi. Um, I was really excited to be the second out of four authors on a paper. That never happens when your last name begins with W. But um, I mean, I, I, I actually have done OK uh, not being the last author on papers, because I've also co-written papers with people named Williamson and Yakimov. But um, it's, it's, it's still tough. Um, all right, and for hypertoric varieties, you get these things called hypertoric enveloping algebras, um, which are actually less fancy than the name suggests. You just take differential operators on a vector space and take torus invariants in it. Um, but still, some interesting stuff happens for them. All right, so confronting these objects, the question, at least, that I ask myself is well, we know a lot of things about Lie theory, tons of things, right? I mean, people spent, well, 100 years figuring out stuff about Lie algebras, most of which are things that can be phrased in terms of the universal enveloping algebra. So how much of this stuff can we generalize? Um, right, this is a, a, a quote which, uh, there was a conference here about a year ago where I ran into Ian Shipman on the bus on the way over, and he said, yeah, Kunkov said this really cryptic thing yesterday. That the symplectic singularities are the Lie algebras of the 21st century. Do you have any idea what that's supposed to mean? I was like, yes, that's what my talk is about. <laughs> All right, so you know, what theorems do we know about universal enveloping algebras that can carry over to this case? So one really famous theorem you might know is that the category of finite dimensional representations of a U of G is semi-simple. Well, it turns out that goes horribly wrong. That, that goes wrong, you know, for C2 mod a cyclic group with three elements. It's just out the window immediately. Um, so turns out that was some piece of luck about universal enveloping algebras. On the other hand, there are these sort of famous character formulas for universal enveloping algebras. The vial character formula being the most famous. There's also this thing I would call the kajdan lustig character formula. People don't usually actually say that combination of words, but it is a character formula found by Kajdan and Lustig. That seems to work sometimes. Um, you have to work hard. You have to really understand the situation you're in. But it happens in, in quite a few different places. Um, so another thing that happens for U of G I'm obviously getting a bit more abstruse, but I'm going to the things that I actually know about. There are some actions of braid groups by functors on representations of U of G. And it turns out these can generalize, but you don't always get a braid group. You might get pi 1 of some other quotient of a hyperplane complement by a finite group. So somehow, if you're willing to broaden your mind about what braid groups should be, you do get something like this. Um, there's also a this localization theorem due to Balenson and Bernstein relating representations of U of G to D modules on G mod B. And there's an equivalent of that. But again, the story is a little bit more complicated. It's a little harder to say exactly which representations it works for, right? I mean, even the original theorem sort of works for some representations, doesn't work for others. So you have to be careful. But at least some things carry over. This, this isn't a completely fruitless endeavor. You can certainly learn interesting things by starting with the theorem about U of G and bringing it over to these other singularities. Any questions? All right, so for me, the thing I'm interested in bringing over, I'll try to explain a little bit about why I want to do this, is this thing called category O. So this is a category of representations of U of G. Um, roughly, you 
pick a Borel, you look at all representations that are generated by a highest weight vector, and you look at different ways to glue those together. Um, so what uh, some collaborators of mine, uh, this is, a, I mentioned this before, Braden, Licata, Proudfoot, and myself, um, it gets pretty big to write that out many times, and we're now on our fifth or possibly sixth paper together, so it comes up a lot, kind of stick to the acronym. We at some point uh, had said that we should find a team name, and I thought, well, if we switch the W and the P, then, then it could be blow up, <laughs> but somehow team blow up just didn't, it wasn't mellifluous enough, it never caught on, eh, what can you do? Anyways, so what, one thing that we did is we defined an, a version of this category O that works for any symplectic singularity, but you need some extra piece of information. So before, I had to choose a Borel. Category O, it's something about highest weight vectors, and highest weight vector only makes sense if you chose a Borel. Well, it turns out the sort of right equivalent thing is a, a Hamiltonian C star action. You can make sense of highest weight vectors for those and thus define a version of category O. Um, and one reason we wanted to do this is for symplectic reflection algebras, certain symplectic reflection algebras, there already were notions of category O. So we wanted something that would generalize that and the classical category O. And indeed, we found such a thing. So these turn out to be some kind of cool categories. Uh, they turn out to be kind of interesting from the perspective of you know, what category they are, can you connect them to some interesting finite dimensional algebra, can you sort of say something about them. So for U of G, this was something that was actually done shockingly recently by Elias and Havanov in type A and by Elias and Williamson in, in general. Um, for hypertoric varieties, this is something that the same group of collaborators and I did, sort of gave a very explicitly presented algebra which is the same as this hypertoric category O. And for quiver varieties, this relates into the story of categorification of Lie algebras. So you end up with something that's called a weighted havanov lauda Rukier algebra. Um, so one interesting thing that happens here is you get a, a new description of category O for certain symplectic reflection algebras. Um, if that's the sort of thing you like. I know there's at least one person in the audience who does. All right, so one of the reasons I was interested in this is, you know, I, I also have a sideline in, in topology where I'm interested in knot invariance. And one way you get knot invariance is by finding interesting braid group actions on things and extracting some kind of trace from those. I'm interested not in numerical knot invariance, but homological knot, invari knot invariance. Knot invariance where the thing you associate to, to a knot is something like a complex of vector spaces. And in order to get those, well, you don't want a Lie algebra, <laughs> you don't want a braid group acting on a vector space. You want a braid group acting on a category. So out of these guys, quiver varieties, you can pull out some braid groups acting on categories that look like you've taken a tensor product of representations for some Lie algebra and turned it into a category. So the sort of precise terminology is uh, you take this category, you take its Grotendieck group, group, and you'll get this tensor product of representations. So this is somehow, um, and there are these things called Reshetik and Turayev invariants that you can get out of natural braid group actions on tensor products of representations of quantum groups. So actually some geometrically defined braid group actions on category O's give you a way to categorify Reshetik and Turayev invariants. So that was kind of one of the things that got me interested in this picture. And I'll say this construction already has an algebraic description, so the thing that was done more recently was to connect it to geometry. So one of the reasons we wanted to look at these category O's is the original category O has some really nice properties. Of course, I. I don't have time to tell you what any of these properties mean, if you don't already know. But this property highest weight means that it has some nice 
particular modules, Verma modules, that interact in some nice way and allow you to have some intermediate step between simples and projectives called standards. Um, there's this property Kashul, which is something about having a grading that interacts very well with the Xs in the category. And somehow it's, it's a particularly nice kind of grading. Um, and then finally, there's the statement that classes of simples in the Grotendieck group are a canonical basis. So what that means is there's a character formula for the simples, um, which is, it's a bit implicit. It's kind of implicit in what the definition of canonical basis means, but that's really what I'm talking about here. There's a character formula for the simples. Um, so in the case of nil cones, well, this is all sort of uh, ancient stuff from the 70s and 80s. So this highest weight property was defined by Klein, Partial, and Scott, inspired by category O. Um, there is this classical work of Balancing, Ginsburg, and Zergel, who I, I think are the right people to ascribe this causality to. Um, and the canonical basis property was conjectured by Kajdam and Lustig, proven by Brulinski and Kashiwara. So the amazing thing is, well, whatever these properties are, they're, they're crazy properties, but they work in all these cases. They don't just work for nil cones, they work for hypertoric varieties. They work for finite or affine type A quiver varieties. So this is a much sort of larger class of varieties and exactly the same things happen. And the really remarkable thing is, so one of the reasons I'm interested in this Kaschul property is there's a way of starting with a, a Kaschul category and getting a dual category. Um, so again, I'm sort of not going to be able to describe this in a way that, uh, that means anything to people who don't already know about it, but uh, it's somehow there's, there's a equivalence of derived categories that switches simples and projectives. So it's somehow taking this category, looking at its derived category, turning your head to the side, looking at, at it in some skewed way, and finding a dual category. Yes, I mean, it, it is one of the things which is true is that, um, right, you have these, I mean, there's this property of, of causal things that um, if you look at the multiplicities of simples and projectives um, and in one category and in the dual, you get basically inverse matrices. So this is one kind of manifestation of that duality. I still have like five minutes, right? Oh. So you have more than 10 minutes if you need it. All right, good. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, you, you were starting to make me worried about time. Anyways, so whatever this is, it's a duality operation that sort of switches pairs of these categories. And the kind of incredible thing is you get another category O when you do this, but it's for a different variety. So, for example, if you take um, C2 monocyclic group, and you do this duality, what you get is, uh, corresponds to rank one matrices in SLN, where N was the order of the cyclic group. I mean, it's, it's totally bizarre operation. Um, but in every case, it, it matches up with some combinatorial duality we already knew. So for nil cones, you can kind of say it corresponds to Langland's duality. For hypertoric varieties, it corresponds to Gale duality of hyperplane arrangements. Um, and for finite or affine type A quiver varieties, it corresponds to rank level duality. And, well, there are these functors I mentioned before that were giving me, well, sometimes a braid group action, sometimes an action by sort of some more complicated group that shows up as a pi one. And these actually get switched with some other family of nice equivalences of derived categories. Um, so whatever these properties are, whatever these functors are, whatever these properties are, the, the amazing fact is they have been known in, t in the nil cone case for a long time, but seems to extend to all these other interesting cases. Um, and at the moment we have no explanation of this. It just is an observed fact where you can sort of 
do all the computations you need to do, you see that it works out. So this, and actually a lot of other evidence, this was not sort of the first piece of evidence we knew about this, but obviously for me it's a very convincing one. We said, okay, it really looks like there's some duality operation on um, conic symplectic singularity. I and mean, we, we have no idea what this operation is, but it, it looks like there is one which sort of takes category O to its casual dual. Um, and really, at the moment, that's kind of the best definition we have. I mean, we have other things we know should match up, but we don't actually have a definition of what X bang would be. We just know lots of examples where we can guess. Um, and I... I just want to emphasize there, there's sort of more behind this than just the categories. I mean, the casual duality to me is, is pretty convincing, but a lot of other things match up. Things involving uh, cohomology rings, yada, yada, yada. Lots, lots of things happen. And luckily, I, one of the reasons we haven't just sort of put this in the desk drawer and forgotten about it is, so uh, as actually about five years ago now, I, I gave a talk about this and afterwards, Sergei Gukov came up to me and where I put up an example of these dual things. And he said, hey, you know, we actually have, you know, in physics, a duality that has exactly the same list of examples. Um, so, I mean, unfortunately, like, I cannot understand the physics papers about this stuff. Um, but, on the other hand, if this is insane, well, there are a bunch of physicists who are, who are insane in exactly the same way. Um, so I, I wouldn't necessarily argue for the sanity of physicists, but um, <laughs> when, when they're doing it in the, the exact same way as us, well then, then maybe we should take it a little seriously. Um, so this seems to be some reflection of a, a duality operation on three-dimensional field theories, whatever that means. Um, unfortunately, that hasn't actually helped us compute any examples, but... Um, it sort of made us feel more justified in going around and telling people, hey, there really should be an operation here. Some, some physicists know about it. All right. So this is what I was sort of coming to as an example of how representation theory can give back. Right? You might have taken my talk as a story of how to sort of steal some stuff from symplectic geometry or algebraic geometry turn it into non-commutative algebra and try to do some interesting non-commutative algebra. But maybe this non-commutative algebra can actually tell us something interesting about geometry. I mean, maybe not. Uh, at the moment, this is the best example I have, but I think this is a pretty intriguing one. All right, thanks very much. Are there, are there questions, comments, suggestions? Physicist who want to say something? So, one more time, what uh, an example of this causal duality, and what does it do to maybe coordinate rings? Or? Um, well, it's hard to say what happens with coordinate rings. So, uh, one other interesting property it seems to have is so, in many cases, you, you have this space X, uh, and it has some resolution of singularities, and there's some torus that acts on both of these. Um, and as it happens, if you look at the equivariant cohomology ring, uh, yeah, I did do that the right way, good, for this guy, this turns out to be the coordinate ring of some union of subspaces inside a vector space. So this is something that happens reasonably often with uh, equivariantly formal torus actions. Um, so this is isomorphic to the coordinate ring of some union of, of subspaces. Yeah, Goreski McPherson, right. Um, I think not Kotwitz, I think just Goreski. Well, okay. I mean, we, we can include Kotwitz, I, I don't care. Um, so, all right, as it turns out, there's so there's supposed to be some dual guy, and that seems to have some dual torus action on it. And the equivariant cohomology ring I get out is C of 
the union of the annihilators of these guys in the dual vector space. So this is inside some W. This is inside W star. Um, so let me see if I can get this right. I believe if you take projective space, your equivariant cohomology ring is spec of a union of lines in N space. And, or wait, do I have this backwards? Anyways, when it, w one of the, the things is, you know, T star PN, which maps down to rank one matrices as a symplectic resolution, um, matching up with C2 mod a cyclic group of order, uh, let me do this right, N plus one. with its unique crepent resolution. So this is one example of a dual pair. Um, and unfortunately, I don't remember at the moment which one of these is the coordinate lines and which one is the coordinate hyperplanes. But um, one is one and the other is the other. Um, so this is sort of another piece of kind of weird evidence that it's the same. So, um, for example, with, uh, yeah. Maybe one, one further question. I mean, some mm -hmm. of the notion of inter-point varieties are normally map and so on fixed, right? Mm -hmm. Does this have anything to do with this picture? And is there a duality between between a point probe and another point probe? Well, I mean, so these guys, right, these are hypertoric varieties. Um, and this one corresponds to the simplex hyperplane arrangement. And this one here corresponds to a bunch of points on a line. So that's what I meant by Gale duality. Um, that in, in the hypertoric case, you know, exactly what happens is, you know, you're, you're associated to some hyperplane arrangement and you take the Gale dual hyperplane arrangement. Uh, so that, that's the connection with sort of toric geometry that I know. Other questions? Comments? All right. Well, then let's thank, thank Ben again.